My name is David Chinnery and I work here at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County. So raised bed gardens, uh, one of my favorite topics because I have lots of raised bed gardens in my own yard and I've been using raised beds probably for the better part of 15 or 20 years. And this picture is not my raised bed. This is one of our master gardeners creations. This is Pat Mulligan who has a very good sense of humor and she made a literally a raised bed garden which is one of my favorite all-time pictures. So a shout out to Pat for her photo there. Um, so again this is part of our lunch in the garden series and we'll be doing these uh, on Wednesdays. Next week we will be doing one on moles and bowls. And if you're on our email list, you can, uh, you'll be getting an email notification on that. Uh, also, we post these uh, announcements on our YouTube, not our YouTube, our Facebook page. <laughs> okay. And if you ever want to contact me, uh, my email is there, dhc3 at cornell.edu. Okay, so let's talk about raised beds. And this is kind of a long uh, PowerPoint, so I'm going to try to zip along here and uh, cover a lot of ground. So the advantages, uh, you can make the soil into what you want in terms of drainage, pH, moisture retention, etc. If you have crummy soil, sandy, rocky, clayey soil, maybe raised beds are the way to go because you can change your soil more easily and you can kind of alleviate problems like poor drainage in a raised bed, which naturally has much better drainage. Uh, raised bed soils warm up quickly in the spring. Um, you're gonna have less weeding. That's really why I love them. I used to have a big in-ground vegetable garden, a big rectangular area, and it was a lot of work to keep the paths weeded, uh, to keep the areas in between plants weeded. And with the raised beds, you're planting closer and you're really eliminating all the paths and sort of the areas you don't really use to grow in. You'll have less soil compaction because you're not walking on your soil. You won't need a rototiller. I used to own a big Troy built horse rototiller and it, that thing would take me for a walk and you don't really need a big machine. You might have a little mantis tiller or something like that or you can just use a shovel or a fork. I think wildlife management is easier and I'll show you some pictures of that. And again, that better drainage, that isn't really a issue this spring because it's been so dry, but in a wet spring, um, it might be difficult to get into a, a in-ground uh, in vegetable garden when we have a lot of rain, but raised beds drain much better. And I think it seems to be easier to be a neater gardener. Um, you know, a raised bed is kind of a small compact unit. You can do a lot more weeding and keep things tidy, I think, in that sort of smaller space. Here's an old picture of my garage. It actually looks a lot better than that these days, but my rototiller is kind of buried in there and I was able to get rid of that and free up a lot of space once I switched to my raised beds. Uh, here's some information from a place called the Dawes Arboretum in Newark, Ohio. And this was put out a number of years ago, but they said the conventional vegetable garden yielded 0.6 pounds of vegetables per square foot, while the raised beds yielded 1.24, so just about double. And you can see how closely those plants are planted in that raised bed there. And that's really the idea to plant close, to crowd out or not really give the weeds very much space, to use your space very efficiently. And um, you'll have actually less work doing that. Of course, there are some disadvantages. Um, I think it might be initially a bit costly to set one of these up and we'll talk about that. Um, it takes some time to set up raised beds. And the, one of the biggest questions I think is where are you gonna get your soil from? That can be kind of a sticking point uh, for some folks. Uh, what materials should I use to make my raised bed? We're gonna talk about that. And how am I gonna get my heavy bulky materials home to build my raised bed? That little picture there was when I used to have my Volkswagen bus, which you could carry you know, two elephants in that thing. Um, if you really only have a small car, it might be kind of hard to carry a lot of lumber home. So. That may be a bit of a challenge for some folks to get some of these building materials home. Okay, so today we're going to talk about where to put your raised bed, the materials you can use to build it, some examples, some costs, and we're going to talk a little bit about soil. I'll be skipping the container gardening section. Okay, so placement number one. I always think you really want to find the sunniest place you can find. 
And in my yard, that's becoming increasingly more difficult as I have a lot of large trees surrounding my backyard and my side yard and a lot of a couple big trees in the yard. But really, these vegetables really want as much uh, sun as they can get. And you might have morning sun, you might have afternoon sun, you might have part sun, part shade. So it really might take a little bit of investigating. Um, I did a project last year where I, where I went out into my yard and I think eight different places and took a picture um, every hour of the day. And it was about June 20th, 21st, the longest day of the year, just so I could document where my sun and my shade was. Uh, because really these vegetables want a good amount of sun, about four hours for the leafy vegetables minimum, four to six hours minimum for leafy and root vegetables, and six to eight uh, hours for the leafy, the root, and the fruiting vegetables like the tomato. So really, if you want to grow tomatoes, you really need a good long period of sun. I think six hours is really pretty sharply cut for a tomato plant. They really want to be out in that sun all day. So Cite your raised beds carefully when it comes to these uh, sunshade factors. Uh, here's an old picture I found. A uh, flat spot is ideal for a raised bed, but of course it's possible to work on slopes and that's where you can get creative. Uh, you know, it's easy to put a raised bed on a flat spot. If you've got a slope, I wouldn't give up entirely, but maybe you can uh, sink down one side of the raised bed and build it up on the other side and do a little creative site work um, and really make it, you know, not very much of a disadvantage. Uh, this picture is on a slope uh, vegetable garden I took many years ago, and you can sort of tell that this is sloping off to the right-hand side, I guess. But you can see there's a lot of activity here and a lot of different raised bed techniques going on, some screening there to keep out some pests apparently on what looks like lettuce in the foreground and some wonderful garlic growing there. Um, so don't let a slight slope at least really deter you. Uh, I really like to emphasize the size of these things. I really am a big proponent of thinking that I really only want my raised bed to be about three to four feet in width, okay? The length can be anything you want, but the width should be a, a space that you can reach across to weed from either side. Now I put this picture in here, which I've never seen this raised bed. I stole this picture. It really is a kind of a cool system there. They've got two different levels going on. It's beautifully built, but how do you get into the center of those raised beds without stepping on them? And to me, that's defeating some of the purpose of the raised bed. I would want these to be narrower or a path to be in between those two levels so I could reach across uh, because I think it's gonna be really difficult to maintain things in a raised bed system that's this wide. So really three to four feet is kind of what I think a raised bed should be. And of course, you know, we're talking about something creative here today. You guys can do whatever you want. Maybe you have better ideas or better systems than I do. I'm just sharing with you what, what I found works for me. So let's talk about materials. Uh, concrete blocks or bricks, certainly that's a way to make a raised bed and you can be quite successful with those. And here's a few pictures of something like that. Uh, here's somebody that really has some very challenging soil. And I can certainly understand why they would want to build raised beds here. Uh, these are landscaping uh, blocks, I guess you'd call them. They've got them up against a house, which could be a sort of a heat uh, trap, I suppose. And it looks like they've got a little uh, irrigation system installed there. So they've got quite a bit going on. And they have kind of a fairly attractive looking setup there, at least in my mind. Um, I would probably either, you know, make that a gravel area or a lawn, but that's kind of besides the point. Um, I would caution about putting soil up against a house. Uh, a little bit might be okay, but I wouldn't want it to touch that wood siding at all, uh, because then you're going to have all sorts of rot issues and perhaps carpenter ants and things like that. Uh, here's another approach. I like this one because they've got an L-shaped raised bed and they're doing some vertical growing there, which we'll show, see some pictures of that as we go along. And this is like a sturdy structure here. Uh, you know, a car could come down the road there and uh, go off the road and probably not really damage that sturdy raised bed with those blocks. So that's another way to go. And here again, they're doing some vertical gardening and, and using blocks as the 
main uh, structure of the raised bed. Um, and again, kind of a nice situation here, um, fairly attractive, I think. Uh, this one I did put in here because it's kind of the same thing. And again, I think if you want a fairly high raised bed or a deep, a soil deep raised bed, maybe the blocks are the way to go. It would be more challenging to build this out of wood, I think. Um, with the blocks, you've got sort of a naturally more stable system. But I would say the planting here is a bit crowded. I think the corn there is kind of being overtaken by what looks like tomatoes. So the raised, uh, you have a little bit of a crowding issue there. And also this again is gonna be kind of hard to reach in and reach across because it is so wide. Uh, here's my friend Angie who works over at Cooperative Extension in Schenectady County. And she's got a little mini raised bed here at the end of the uh, cold frames. And she's planting in the little pockets of the blocks, which I think is kind of cool. And I believe that was an herb garden that the master gardeners have put together there. So you can be kind of creative with those holes in the blocks. Um, I have a little hoop house greenhouse that isn't heated and I've used raised blocks or blocks to make a little bed in there and I can grow spinach um, in the early spring and I can grow tomatoes later in the fall with that. And that's just kind of a little aside here. This is the little hoop house and raised beds kind of lend themselves to either being in a hoop house or maybe making a hoop house over the raised bed with plastic or um, some other material that's uh, see-through clear and allows light uh, inside and you're going to have a temperature differential and uh, the famous gardener named Elliot Coleman who wrote many gardening books back in the day said one of these hoop houses or a cold frame was like moving your garden 500 miles south or one full zone warmer. So if you're at all interested in extending your season on your gardening, gardening earlier or gardening later um, with vegetables, uh, you might think about making some of these little structures and the one on the right hand side they are particularly like uh, that's just some bent conduit and um, you know they've got some plastic over the top and they can really be gardening in that little space early and late. Okay so the pros and cons of those blocks they're easy to work with and stack really no skill needed they may absorb and hold some heat. Uh, the ones I got were free you know that's always one of the great things about gardening is finding things for free uh, so that was a pro for me. Uh, you, the could, blocks could be used if you get uh, tired of the raised bed. They could be used for other things, taken apart. It's easy to make any width, size, and shape you want. Um, they can get costly. Now, this was a few years ago. I priced them out, and they were about $1.50 each. Now, I'm going to say this a couple times today. We all know what's happened to building materials. The prices of building materials have skyrocketed. So that is an old price. You're probably looking at I would guess two and three dollars a piece for these blocks at this point. You don't want to put them too high and make them unstable. Aesthetics can be plus or minus depending on what you've got going on. But really the main thing you're probably going to think about with a raised bed is lumber because that's what most people end up using for a raised bed. So let's talk about lumber pros and cons for a minute. Uh, relatively easy to work with lumber. I have what I consider very minimal carpentry skills and I'll show you what I can do. So I believe probably almost anybody can make a raised bed with a little bit of uh, elbow grease and maybe a few tools. Certainly we can make a wide variety of sizes and shapes of raised beds. There's a variety of woods available, which we'll talk about. And I think most of the wooden raised beds are fairly pleasing looking. Um, you have to think about the lifespan of the wood you're using and we'll talk about that. Uh, we will answer some questions about pressure treated lumber. And that's a question we get really all the time about raised bed. Is it safe to use pressure treated wood for raised beds? Well, a little history, a little background of that uh, issue. Uh, years ago, back when I was a kid, let's say the 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, creosote and pentachlorophenol were used to treat wood. Uh, I remember people building raised beds out of railroad ties that they found, and the railroad ties would ooze that creosote and really smell like tar and smell like the railroad. Uh, not a good idea because that stuff was really bad for plants and bad for people. So we don't see that really being used anymore, or hopefully not. Then the next generation of product was really this 
a product called CCA or chromated copper arsenate wood. And that was widely used for landscape purposes as well as decks and raised beds. Uh, there was some concern that the arsenic uh, from that could leach into the soil and get into the plants. And there were some studies done that did show that that arsenic could move into the soil, especially uh, under a deck. I don't know that really uh, it was a big issue with uh, raised beds in the same way. Um, and we really didn't hear of people getting sick from that or dying because good grief, arsenic is pretty toxic, right? Uh, we don't need Miss Marple to tell us that. Uh, but the concern was that people would eat the plants and ingest the arsenic, but really the plants were not taking up the arsenic. So plants were able to exclude the arsenic. So that really wasn't a very big issue. But nevertheless, that CCA lumber was phased out by the end of 2003. Uh, they would say that root vegetables were at some risk. And if you kept up the pH and kept up the phosphorus or lined the bed with plastic, you would really minimize your risk. But really, we don't have to worry about that anymore because that CCA lumber is pretty much not available. Nowadays, we have ACQ lumber. And that's uh, an acronym that stands for alkaline copper quaternary ammonium. And this is lumber that has been treated with no chromium or arsenic or any other chemical considered toxic by the EPA or um, treated with anything that's a suspected or known carcinogen. It has copper in it and it also has this stuff called quat. And quat is something you'll find in household wipes, sprays and disinfectants and also swimming pools. So it's something we know a lot about and it's not particularly toxic to people. Uh, but it is toxic to insects and fungi, which are going to try to break down your lumber. Uh, this stuff doesn't really leach out, only in small amounts, and it's really held tightly to soil particles and not really taken up by plants. And here I put that if the plants take up too much copper, the plants would die before the gardener would eat them. So the plants aren't going to take this stuff up. It's not going to really leach too uh, badly in the soil. That's what our current science tells us. Okay, so that's where we are with that. I believe it's fairly safe to use this ACQ lumber. Okay, and if we wanna know about lumber, we can look at the little tags on lumber and we wanna make sure that we find lumber that's uh, treated um, and it says it's rated for ground contact. Now this is a piece of lumber I bought a couple of weeks ago and I did see on my tag, it does say ground contact. And that's the best kind to use for a raised bed if it's got that rating on it, because then we're going to know it's resistant to uh, decay. But what if you don't want to use treated lumber? If you're a strictly organic gardener, there are other options of wood that's naturally got some resistance to rot in it. And those would be things like cypress and redwood, which are really very hard to find uh, nowadays and probably not something you're going to really end up using. But we do have a black locust. And we do have hemlock, which are locally produced. I'll show you some pictures of those. And there also is cedar of very uh, various types. And these beds in this picture were built by a friend of mine many years ago, and I believe these were locust. So what about black locust? Now, black locust is a tree. It's sort of a native species. It grows natively here in Rensselaer County in the Capital District. Um, it really is native south of here in the Appalachians and the Ozark Mountains. So some people call it actually an invasive species, but it does have a long history of use in buildings and construction because it does have a lot of natural rot resistance to it. Uh, the old farms, farmers would use this lumber uh, when anywhere where they were gonna put something in the ground. Fence posts were very commonly made of black locusts and reportedly it lasts for decades. Um, you can find this available from local sawmills and the folks over at Capital Sawmill uh, which is not too far from my house in Skodak, sent me a couple pictures of this. So thank you for that. There's a picture of some black locust lumber that they would be selling from the Capitol Sawmill. And these are some raised beds that they have there on site. I believe you probably can go take a look at these uh, if you go buy the lumber. And uh, the folks there said, the black locust is so hard that the dried wood has to be drilled because it will bend a nail. So I really like that picture of the raised beds there. Uh, made out of the Rensselaer County black locust. Another option, of course, is hemlock, and that's the one I have more personal experience with. 
This is a hemlock raised bed that we built at our demonstration garden at the Robert C. Parker School in North Greenbush uh, in 2007, and it lasted about eight years, and then we rebuilt it. Um, my experience with hemlock is that it is about eight to 10 years of life that you can get from a hemlock raised bed. Uh, this was the first iteration of that garden. It looks pretty much the same today. If you want to go see these hemlock raised beds, uh, take a look at our herb garden. It's a very lovely garden and those are raised hemlock beds. We got rid of the wooden pathway here because that rotted and it was just too much maintenance. So we just went with the wood chips. Um, here are some raised beds that I had at my house years ago made out of hemlock. And you can see they're pretty standard looking, attractive. Um, these are four feet wide and eight feet or 10 feet or 12 feet long, depending on the sit base. And I'll talk to you about uh, the, the size in just a minute. Uh, here we are transporting hemlock. If you buy hemlock from a local sawmill, um, it will be fairly heavy. It's a fairly heavy lumber. Uh, you won't find this at Home Depot or the chain stores. You will have to go to an um, independent sawmill in the area. So what are the tools you're going to need for building a raised bed? And this kind of goes for whatever lumber you're going to use. I like to have a pair of gloves, a tape measure, a pencil, my eye protection, my square, which is the L-shaped piece there. Of course, we have our mask, which we uh, are certainly uh, know all about uh, during these pandemic days. And that's a circular saw. You could use a handsaw if that's all you had. Uh, you'd need a little arm strength and <laughs> I'm better with a circular saw these days. And also I tend to use the uh, black drywall screws. Now, technically probably you should use deck screws and that's what I'll tell you today. I've had fairly good luck with these black drywall screws not rotting or or resisting corrosion for quite a number of years. So I kind of use whatever screws I have, but deck screws are probably what you really want to use. Uh, maybe a galvanized deck screw would be what to look for. And here I am laying out a raised bed. This was a hemlock raised bed in my side yard built many years ago. And you can see I've got a four foot piece uh, on either end. And I believe those were two eight foot sections. So this is going to be four feet wide, 16 feet long. And I've got some little extra scraps that I'm going to use in the corners as extra bracing. Uh, and here's my screws that I'm just screwing in. I usually tend to drill a pilot hole and then I put in my screw after that. And you can say I have an extra block behind there that's holding it together. Um, I like these little clamps to hold things together as well sometimes um, when I'm building those longer sections. And really, this was an earlier prototype, I guess I would say. This is 16 feet long, and now I would never build a raised bed this long. I would build them shorter and with more cross bracing because what happens is the soil is heavy and the soil is gonna naturally wanna push out the sides if you make them that long. So they're gonna get kind of weakened by the soil um, after a while. I usually make my raised beds about eight feet long at this point. Uh, but here's my cheating system for growing tomatoes. I know it's not the most attractive, I certainly will admit that, but I have my raised bed, I do my soil preparation, I might put in my uh, irrigation uh, weep hose or, or drip irrigation, whatever I'm using. Um, I put on my black plastic, I know it's ugly, it's not particularly uh, earth friendly either, but if you really want to have a weed free garden, this is the lazy person's way to do it. You poke your holes in your black plastic, you put your tomato plants in with a cage and a stake, and you are kind of on autopilot for a lot of the season. Um, I'm not gonna be using black plastic uh, pretty much in the future. I'm gonna go back to my natural mulches because I really wanna reduce my use of plastic. Uh, you can have some weed issues though if you've got persistent weeds in an area. I do have some persistent weeds uh, or persistent type of weed called uh, quack grass. And this is really the only weed issue I have in my raised beds. This comes from the surrounding lawn. You can see the big rhizomes or roots that this has and it grows into the raised beds where I just pull it out and luckily I keep up with it. Um, if I was to let this go, it would really infest the raised bed. So keep up with your weeds um, by hand pulling or digging them out. And I don't really have a huge issue with this, just a little pulling every once in a while. But this is the problem I really wanted to share with you. The great potato and dahlia disaster which happened probably seven, eight, nine years ago uh, with my dahlias. I was growing my dahlias and my potatoes in raised beds. 
And you know those are both crops or plants that have a big root system, a tuberous root system. Well, these guys, especially the vole, which is the guy on the right-hand side, can tunnel under the earth. And the vole, the guy on the right-hand side, not the mole with the big paws, really likes to eat the roots. And I had a very large population of these voles in my raised beds. And they literally ate every potato and every dahlia plant during a couple growing seasons. And I really thought I was going to have to give up gardening. And I was really pretty dis disappointed by that. The voles, it's V-O-L-E-S, are really very voracious little creatures when it comes to eating the root systems of plants. So in 2013, I thought up my solution. And that was galvanized steel, one quarter inch mesh, uh, hardware cloth, I call it. Uh, I rebuilt my first raised bed using that. Put this all along the bottom, made sure there were no gaps in it. And this cost me uh, for a four foot wide roll, 50 feet long. At the time, it was $62. I'm sure I would pay quite a bit more than that for this now. But this was the prototype raised bed. And I have to say that once I started using this galvanized steel uh, hardware cloth underneath, I really haven't had a vole problem in my raised bed. So this has been a great solution. Uh, that bed there was a hemlock raised bed rebuilt in 2013. By 2021, it had pretty much collapsed. So I'm gonna, I rebuilt this this spring and I'll show you a picture of that coming up and I reused the hardware cloth. So this kind of got me thinking about how to do these the most efficient way. Um, I've switched over to using pressure treated lumber because I'm getting old and I don't wanna keep rebuilding these things and the pressure treated will last quite a bit longer than the hemlock. So the standard raised bed nowadays in my garden is eight foot long, 10 inches high and it's got the steel uh, hardware cloth underneath. And pretty much all of my raised beds are built like that. This was a longer one I built with a cross brace. Um, you can see how that's done. This is that rotten one that I just rebuilt this spring and it's now rebuilt in uh, pressure treated and it's all ready to go. So I pretty much have all of my raised beds rebuilt now with the hardware cloth underneath. Now you're gonna say, should I do that? Should I do that in my garden? Well, if you don't have voles and moles, especially voles, um, maybe you don't need to bother with that hardware cloth. So I'm not saying everybody has to do that. I'm just saying if you have voles in your yard and you know it, build your raised beds with the hardware cloth underneath. Uh, one more note about the hemlock. Uh, the last time I gave this talk, uh, one of our participants uh, shared this, which was shared by Valenti Lumber, which is one of our local sawmills. And they will uh, have on their website a little bit of information about if you use the hemlock, you can use a wood preservative called Valhalco, which supposedly is all natural. I looked it up, I'm not sure about that, uh, to increase the life of the hemlock lumber. So there are some other options there. Uh, you might also ask how much soil do I need to fill that raised bed? So my raised bed is four feet wide, eight feet long and about 10 inches deep. And it's just about one cubic yard of soil. So that's about what I need, uh, one cubic yard or 27 square feet to fill that up, plus or minus something. Okay, so what about other options here? Uh, we have cedar, and these are cedar raised beds that we built in our demonstration garden back in 20, oh man, 2009, I think it was. These are still there. I think they're still fairly functional. Haven't checked them this year. But cedar is uh, naturally resistant to rot. Um, it's fragile because this is really only one inch lumber and it's very expensive, but you can use cedar if you can find it. Uh, how about making them taller? This is back to the uh, locust raised bed and here at Capitol Sawmill, they built a two high, uh, two board high raised bed. So you can certainly do that out of the locust. And then we also have experimented with using the composite or the plastic lumber or the decking material. And these raised beds we have at our, uh, again, at our demonstration garden have lasted perfectly for a number of years. And um, you know, if you wanna go that route, you could certainly do that. So what about that composite lumber? Well, it's fairly easy to work with. Um, it comes in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. It's a product of recycling. So could we call that green? I suppose we could. They're fairly pleasing looking. And I think they're gonna have a very long lifespan. 
Um, they're probably safe. I've never heard of that product leaching out or really harming uh, the soil or the plants at all. Uh, but they can be expensive, okay? Now here's some data I put together, okay? Back in 2020, uh, I redid this talk and I put this chart together. So to build a four by eight foot raised bed in 2020 for my pressure treated lumber from a local home center, it was gonna cost me $29.94, okay? For hemlock at the same time from a local sawmill, it was gonna cost me about $33. The composite lumber from a home center was gonna cost about 120 and the cedar was gonna cost about $90. Now I put in blue there, $61 in 2021. We've seen these lumber prices double. Some people say triple or even quadruple. So I don't know what the hemlock and the composite lumber and the cedar are priced at at this point, but you might wanna do a little homework before you go off to the store because you might have a sticker shock as they used to call it uh, when you see lumber prices. It is gonna be more uh, expensive now that the the pandemic has come and all these prices have gone up for various reasons. So be careful with your, your dollars there. Um, and again, if you wanna go see the raised beds uh, built out of cedar and the composite lumber, they are at our demonstration garden. And these are pictures of that garden um, in its glory in the summertime growing the vegetables. And again, that's at um, the Robert C. Parker School on Route 43 in North Greenbush. Uh, here I've got a little list of the local sawmills. So I wanted to give out a shout to these local businesses because they are mostly in Rensselaer County. Here we have a couple in Columbia County as well that I've dealt with and they all have some really nice products. So if you are thinking about using something other than the pressure treated lumber, these are some of the folks you can talk to. Okay, so how to plant a raised bed. Let's talk about that for just a couple minutes. Uh, my thinking in planting raised beds comes from the very famous and revered, at least in my eyes, Mel Bartholomew. And Mar Mel Bartholomew back in the early 80s, I believe it was, wrote a book called Square Foot Gardening. And that's him on the left-hand side there with the, the white background and the green writing, Square Foot Gardening. And his idea was to plant in grids. And he's got a picture there of him in his garden. And you can see it's not really a raised bed garden. There's some wooden boards for pathways there. But his idea was to plant in these tightly um, controlled grids and you planted your vegetables not in long rows like we were taught to in a vegetable garden kind of traditionally that we would have uh, cultivation between the rows and maybe some wide paths but you would plant in these grids and it really to me was a revolutionary way to look at things because you could grow a lot more uh, produce in a smaller space. Now the all new square foot gardening, Mel updated that um, probably 20, 25 years later. And really that was a book more focusing on the raised bed. So if you wanna have some fun and you uh, wanna plant like Mel, this is kind of where you go to Square Foot Gardening. I think there's a website and all sorts of resources on the internet. Here's one of our early raised beds and we have it kind of gridded out. I don't think that those are square feet there though because this is probably actually four foot wide. So this is planting on a grid basically you get the idea. It's a very efficient way to do it. Uh, here's a page stolen from Mel's original book showing that, uh, let's see, the four inch spacing for bush beans and spinach, the six inch spacing for Swiss chard, leaf lettuce and parsley, and a whole 12 inch square is required for broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, corn, eggplant, muskmelon, and pepper plants. So you get the idea here, the bigger the plant, it's gonna need a bigger square. And uh, you have to kind of just, uh, modify your, your grid a little bit, but we're basically always planting on this square foot idea. And here's another page that actually shows little dots for the individual plants, which I think is pretty cool. And he really planted almost everything on the square foot. Uh, the tomatoes were one of those things that were a little bit hard to do in this way. Um, you'd probably need a two and a half by two and a half foot square uh, system for that. Uh, Mel would grow those up on a lattice or a trellis though. I believe that's what his premise was for uh, tomatoes. But here I'm planting some onion sets uh, using kind of the Mel system. And you can see, you know, you get your tape measure out there and you can make nice little rows in your raised bed and do a very efficient job. 
And here again, Mel was also a proponent of uh, the trellising, and that's the uh, trellis garden with the tomatoes and the climbing beans uh, going up the back. Okay, so that's my shout out to Mel. Uh, let's look at some examples of raised beds. And here we are again back with Pat Mulligan and her brilliant raised bed garden. Um, I've seen a lot of raised bed gardens over the years. So some of these pictures are old and some of them are new. Uh, these are some raised beds that were actually at the Robert C. Parker School when we started gardening there. Uh, they were not in very good condition, so they only lasted a couple seasons and our gazebo is actually on that spot right now. But you can see that those are, I think, five-sided raised beds sort of arranged in a circle. And it really was kind of a cool pattern. Um, if you wanted to grow something um, like a flower garden, maybe you would plant uh, or plan your raised beds a little bit more uh, off the grid or, or in a little bit more of a casual system. So that's a really good example of not having the David rectangle necessarily, or even the L shape. You can get fancier and wilder with your shapes here. Uh, the only caution I would say that that's going to be a little trickier to mow the grass around there. That's going to take you a little more maintenance time. Uh, Barbara Neufer, one of our famous master gardeners, has a wonderful garden in Nassau, and here's a raised bed shade garden. So you're not limited to vegetables, and you're not limited to that full day of sun that I was talking about. If you want to plant a shade garden uh, with perennials and bulbs and wonderful uh, plants, you can do that in raised beds as well. And that's a great example of doing something really very different with the idea of raised beds. Uh, here we are at Rent Van Rensselaer Manor a number of years ago, and raised beds are great for folks that have mobility issues. Uh, you have a higher <clears throat> uh, system to work with. You have a higher uh, level where your plants are. So uh, folks with limited mobility, maybe that are using uh, walkers or rollivators or, or whatever you call those devices nowadays, can access this garden much more easily. Um, I would caution about the treated wood when it's got a lot of chemical in it, when it's very new. Some folks, if they touch that with their bare hands, can get some skin irritation. So you might want to put some protective cover over that, maybe a little plastic uh, where the folks were leaning on that. But again, your imagination can be uh, only, your only limit, right, for using raised beds uh, in some of these kind of situations. How about some pest management? Again, the bigger creatures. Here's Kathy Town, one of our master gardeners who has a wonderful garden and some of Kathy Town's raised beds, I think years ago, uh, she just surrounded them with uh, chicken wire as needed to keep out things like the groundhog and things like the deer. So that could be something that could be taken down fairly easily or uh, moved fairly easily as, as you uh, wanted to do that. Uh, Kathy Town also has a fancier raised bed garden with a very beautiful fence surrounding it. And, you know, we get questions all the time about uh, deer and rabbits and groundhogs. And really, you know, there's very limited options. It's going to be exclusion through fencing of some sort, sometimes repellents. Uh, repellents will work for deer better than some of the other creatures, but even deer can get uh, used to the repellents. So fencing and repellents, maybe you have to think about that uh, with your raised bed gardens. Uh, here we are back at my house. Uh, this is my, no, it's not really my house, but I wish that was my house. That's my Long Island house. It's called Old Westbury Garden. <laughs> and of course, they would have very high class raised beds. Uh, I like the dovetail joints on these at the corners, very well done, lovely gravel, uh, but this is a tight area. Think about your spacing. Um, you can't really get a wheelbarrow in here. Um, do you want to move your garden cart in and out? How much area do you need? Can you work in a very tight situation? Uh, what's your, your spacing between the raised beds? These are all things you'll have to work out uh, in developing your system. Here's a garden that doesn't exist anymore. This was at New York Botanical Garden and they had uh, sort of a concrete, stamped concrete uh, surface here around the raised beds and they're doing some trellises. So there's different uh, depths of planting there. Uh, here again is my friend Tom's raised beds. Uh, very kind of neat tongue and groove raised beds that these were made out of hemlock or I should say a black locust. Uh, but again, think about how wide your paths have to be. I've kind of standardized to my garden that paths have to be the width of my garden cart. 
because I drag my garden cart all over the place. And that's a little bit wider than three feet. So when I make raised beds nowadays, that's really the minimum. And if I'm gonna put them on a lawn, I wanna make them wide enough for my mower to go through. I am really a lazy gardener and I wanna be able to ride on my John Deere and get around these raised beds and really keep uh, the grass down, at least, you know, maybe not perfectly, but in the big scene. So I make my raised beds uh, about mm, probably 55 inches apart, something like that. Maybe you don't have that much space though. I have a little bit of a luxury with space. Um, and again, here's a raised bed we used to have at the Scattercoke Fair. And of course I put this in here because again, this is very wide. And to work in this raised bed, you had to step on the soil. So it was a raised bed garden, but it didn't really alleviate the problem of walking on your soil, which some people don't want to do. But again, you can create a very nice picture here and a very nice display. Um, and again, this is the idea of using the row cover. Um, if you want to use row cover or remake cloth and keep some pests out without spraying, again, a raised bed is kind of a nice way to do that because you can use this bendy plastic conduit and put that over the raised bed in arches. And one year back uh, down at the demo garden in, in the Robert C. Parker School, we wanted to grow zucchini without having it being infested by the squash vine borer, which kills a lot of squash plants in this part of the world. So we grew Pardanon parthenocarpic zucchini, a variety that does not need to be cross-pollinated, it's self-pollinating. And we grew it under this row cover and we could grow that uh, zucchini without the squash vine borer pest getting into it. So that was kind of a really great experiment. We had bags of zucchini you can see in that top picture there. Uh, one of my favorite old pictures, I'd stole this from someplace, uh, raised bed gardens on pallets. Uh, here maybe somebody wants to move these around at some point during the season and they've got a pallet jack there. <laughs> and that's called mobile gardening, I guess. Um, if you go over to the uh, Berkshire Botanical Garden, I don't know if this is still there like this, but a few years ago, they built a very large raised bed garden and it was quite extensive with these four by four foot raised beds. So that was kind of a neat situation there. Uh, we had a master gardener named Paul and Paul had an incredible raised bed garden. This is his entire backyard and his whole yard was raised bed gardening. So you can see he's using lots of different techniques there. Uh, with the hoops and the covers and the, uh, some vertical gardening along the back row there. Uh, you can kind of let this expand as much as you want and really let it take over your entire yard and have a complete raised bed environment. And some commercial growers are actually using raised beds. A number of years ago, we were at the Berry Farm in Chatham, a wonderful local grower, and they were having, uh, they had just built this greenhouse with raised beds that were heated by solar panels and uh, very high tech. So some of the very uh, you know, valuable vegetable crops can be grown in raised beds under uh, plastic. And here's a new raised bed garden I saw just recently in somebody's backyard. And they are using big rubber treads from machinery as raised beds. So I'm gonna keep an eye on this um, as it develops now that I know where it is and see how their raised beds look this gardening year. So let's uh, delve into a few store-bought options. I haven't updated these prices, but if you're intimidated by the carpentry skills needed or, or you wanna make something simple, uh, some of these companies like Gardener Supply will sell you a raised bed. They tend to be fairly expensive for what they are, but of course you're buying convenience. So here's one made out of cedar. Um, it's about 15 inches tall and two feet long and four feet wide. Uh, fairly expensive when you consider what you can do on your own. Um, a forever raised bed built out of the composite plastic lumber. Also, you know, $178 is not, not really a bargain. You can do a lot cheaper on your own, I think. But there are options out there, so you can explore those. Uh, we haven't talked too much about the elevated planters, but occasionally I do see people building these. Again, for folks that maybe can't bend over as well anymore or have limited mobility, I'm sure you could find some plans for these online and build this yourself, but here's one for about 350 bucks. Uh, back when we had the flower show at the Hudson Valley uh, Community College, Half Moon Works was a group that would come and 
show off their wonderful raised beds. Uh, these were made out of cedar and they were secured by fiberglass uh, corner pins, really nice quality raised beds that they were making. And um, they had a really neat display. Some of these were over at the uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension in Schenectady. And you can see those wonderful uh, joints on the corners there. Um, I believe that this group is now working in um, Schenectady at a place called SEAT or Social Enterprise and Training Center. But the last time I looked, I wasn't able to find a lot of info, but that's a local nonprofit that makes raised beds. So I wanted to give them a shout out there. Uh, let's just close out today with talking a little bit about the soil. And of course, buying soil for a raised bed can be a bit tricky because soil has no official definition, okay? And buying soil is sort of like going out to the Wild West. There's all sorts of stuff for sale and some of it is good and some of it maybe is not so good. But if you go to our YouTube channel, I do have a recording that we made last year called The Dirt on Soil, How to Buy It. And you can uh, view that and really that goes into some uh, more depth than I can do right now um, on this issue of buying soil. Um, I'm pretty lucky because I have excess soil from a patio project I did many years ago and I kind of hoard my soil. Um, if I build a new raised bed, I put in one third leaf compost and two thirds soil and I have a nice mix there. Uh, we always want to check our pH for soil. Uh, 6.2 to 7.0 is okay and we don't want to add lime or sulfur without that test. We would ideally like a soil that had relative uh, equal amounts of sand, silt, and clay. Um, how do we improve soil? Really, it's through compost, either leaf compost or manure compost. We might add fertilizer, either organic or inorganic, uh, and how much fertilizer do you really need? Now, this is a cooperative extension program, so of course, I'm going to talk about soil testing. And this information is all on our website, which is at ccerenselier.org. If you're interested in testing your soil, we send our tests over to the University of Massachusetts, and they give us a report back that has pH, phosphorus, calcium, a lot of the micronutrients, as well as organic matter and recommendations for three crops. So um, if you're going to go big into raised beds or maybe have some questions about your soil, we can help you with your soil testing, and UMass is the partner organization. Now, if you don't want to do soil testing, how much fertilizer would you use in your raised bed? Well, you could go by the standard practice, and that's about one, one and a quarter pounds of 10, 10, 10, or two and a quarter pounds of 5, 10, 5 per 100 square feet. And we would turn that into the soil of our raised bed before we would plant it. So I wanted to give you one example of when things don't go so well. And this is a community garden in Rensselaer County. It's at a, a apartment complex, really nicely done. They have a number of these raised beds. I think there's 30 raised beds in this garden. And uh, the folks there had been gr growing in these for a couple seasons when they called me and they said, you know, our plants are really not doing well. Uh, we don't know what's going on. So I went by and uh, we talked about it and took a look at the soil and we did a pH test. And a pH test is the relative alkalinity or acidity. And we want that pH to be ideally about 6.5. And the pH of these soils in these raised beds was well over 8.0, making them very alkaline. And a lot of the soil that we can buy is in fact very alkaline. So these folks have been adding sulfur to drive down the pH of that soil and the gardens have been improving, but be careful with buying um, soil. Okay, uh, Mel, well back to Mel Bartholomew, he says to put in your raised bed a mix of one third peat, one third coarse vermiculite, and one third compost. So there are other alternatives besides soil. Um, I've never gardened in a raised bed with that, but that's kind of a similar mix you could use uh, for something like a container garden. Okay, and one other poor, important point uh, or important list here about topsoil, and this again is in the other video. Um, if you buy soil, never have it delivered before you look at it, touch it, does it feel very sandy? Does it feel very clay? Can you make pots or does it feel like the beach. We don't want either of those really conditions. We don't want stinky soil. I've seen soil in Rensselaer County that really had some suspicious kind of waste in it and really didn't smell very good, sold as topsoil, or it's full of wood chips. We still see that quite a bit 
Soil shouldn't have a lot of wood chips in it. That's a bulking agent that they're using to really stretch what they've got. It should be dark in color. And if we can get a pH test or a nutrient report from the supplier, that would be wonderful. Not so sure how that's gonna work, okay? And know that there is no definition officially in New York State for topsoil. But um, watch that video and you'll get some more pointers if that's the direction you wanna go. Uh, we do see plants or some weeds being moved by soil as well. Uh, Equisetum, this is called a horsetail weed. Uh, this is a very pernicious weed if you get it in your garden. And we have seen this moved with wood chips as well as soil. So if you go to look at soil at a supplier and there's weeds growing in the pile of soil that they're gonna sell you, uh, be a little leery of that, okay? So in closing, um, I would say that I really encourage mulching. I didn't put too much information about that um, in here. I probably should put some pictures. I use a leaf mulch. I have shredded leaves that I pile up in the fall and I use that as my uh, mulch on most of my raised beds um, and I'm phasing out that black plastic. Again, that vertical gardening, which we really just touched upon, but that's something that can really be adapted to the raised beds uh, with some creativity as far as constructing a trellis. You could grow tomatoes, you could grow climbing beans, you could grow your squashes, uh, your trailing cucumbers up the trellis, and that would be a really cool project. And really have fun. Uh, there's lots of different ways to go here. Uh, this is one of the most exotic raised beds I've seen. A friend of mine that does dog training and runs a dog kennel made a dog-friendly raised bed garden out of tires. So that's a little bit wide of our topic today, but I just really thought that was fun. These were all plants that dogs like and are safe for dogs. And you can see the, the dogs were checking this out. So even our canine companions can uh, really enjoy raised beds. 